Cause and effect. Every reaction comes first from an action. You can measure an impact by the waves it creates. And my actions are a wave. Every choice and effect by a cause. So my life is because of a cause worth my life. An impact resounding through me. So why do I persevere? From what comes this hope? From where this compassion? Why do I love? Because. Cause and effect. Almost everything we do has an impact. And, and this, this wonderful word, because, really lies between something that happened and, and something else. Daddy, Mommy, why do I have to keep sitting in the timeout chair? Because for the fifth time in a row, you took your little sister's toy and you wouldn't give it back. Cause and effect. Why don't you trust me? Because you've lied to me over and over again. Because. Cause and effect. But it's not just negative things, it's also positive things. It's understanding that, that our, what we do has positive effects as well. Because you're my friend, I will help you move. Because you're my friend, I'll drive you to the airport. Because you're my friend, I'll do something for you. That's what happens. Because of this, I will do this. Here's a powerful one. Why do you serve and care so much? Because I know Jesus. And he gave everything for me. Our lives are a series of causes and effects. And in this Easter season, we kind of have this little compressed amount of time. Today, Sunday, and then this coming Friday is Good Friday. And a couple days later is Easter Sunday. In this eight-day period, we're going to have three services. Today, Good Friday, and Easter. And all of them are surrounding this word because. Ultimate epic, spiritual cause and effect. Today, we're talking about the simple concept. Because he lives, I love. Because Jesus Christ lives today, I can love others. On Good Friday, we'll talk about the reality that because he died, I live. My life right now is transformed. Because he died, I live. And on Easter Sunday, and oh, be sure you take the time to be there at one of our numerous services and invite everyone you know to come online to church this Easter Sunday. It couldn't be easier to go to church this Easter. Easter 2020, one of the most easiest invitations you'll ever give. Here's the link to our service. Here's what it's about. Come join us. This Easter service, here's the theme. Because he rose, we can live forever. What good, knows because Je what good news because Jesus Christ lives and because he rose again from the dead, we can live forever. Our life changes today, but we live for all of eternity with Jesus Christ. That's good, good news. Jesus is alive. Christians say stuff like that. I believe that Jesus Christ is alive today and we mean it. But what does this really mean? What does it mean if we say, Jesus Christ is alive today. And, and it's declaring something incredible. There is deep, rich theology behind these words that Jesus Christ is alive. So what do I say when I declare that Jesus Christ lives? It's more than just the fact that he lives. There's something behind that. So here's what we're declaring when we say that Jesus Christ lives. We're saying he really came into this world, the incarnation, that God Almighty came among us as one of us, God in a human body, born in a manger. He really came to this world. When we say that Jesus is alive, we say that he really died. To say he's alive implies that he died to pay for our sins, that Jesus Christ on the cross actually physically died. His life ended. That God who came among us, who took on human flesh, he died on that cross. He was buried in the tomb and he was buried for three days. When we say that Jesus is alive, we're declaring that he also rose from the dead. Not only did he die on the cross, he rose again in glory. He rose again in power. He rose and he was alive. We're saying that he is really alive today. 
Not just, not just a, a, a figure of speech. Not just sort of, well, what we mean is that there's, there's this hopefulness in our hearts. No, we believe that Jesus Christ, who physically died on the cross, who was buried in the tomb, who was dead for three days, he, he had a bodily resurrection, and he is alive today. He ascended to heaven, and he's still present. He's still working. He's still active. So he is really present today. We, we can walk with Jesus. There, there's, there's an old hymn. An old hymn that, that I, I didn't grow up in the church, so I didn't grow up learning hymns, but when I became a pastor, I spent a number of years in a, at a traditional older church, and there was, there was this one hymn where they would say, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. He, this idea that he walks, he talks, that he lives, he's alive, he's present, he's part of our lives. He is present today deeply, personally, and that means he is in me, he is with me, and he is leading me. I don't walk through life wondering where to go next, but I take the hand of Jesus and I walk with him and I follow him and I go where he calls me to go. I walk with Jesus Christ moment by moment and day by day. When we say that Jesus Christ is alive, we are declaring a rich theology of the incarnation and the coming of Jesus, of his real life in this world, of his death on the cross for our sins in our place to pay the price, of his resurrection on the third day, the fact that he's ascended to heaven and he's alive and working today on our behalf, that he's present in our lives, he's personal, deeply personal, and he is with us all the time. When you say Jesus is alive, it is saying something so deep and so rich and so powerful. And because he lives, our lives are different. Because he lives, everything changes. Because he lives, I can love others as he loves me. I want to think together, what does it mean to say he lives? We're saying, when, he say, when we say because he lives, we're saying I can love people as Jesus loves me. And part of me says, Man, that's not even possible. I can't love that way, but I can with the love of Jesus in me, the one who's risen, the one who's alive, the one who's present today. His power in me gives me strength to love others. In, the, in 1 John chapter 4, and if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, go to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 7. And there's this beautiful picture, this call to love others the way that we've been loved through the grace and the glory of Jesus Christ. 1 John 4, beginning in verse 7, we read these words. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Since God loved us that way, we should love each other. That's the call of God. That's the heart of Jesus. That's what it means to walk with one who is alive, a, a living Savior. So here's a question for you. How can the presence and power of Jesus in you empower you to love others more? If you walk with Jesus, if he's really alive, if you say, I am a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, th then you're becoming more like Jesus with every passing day. You're walking with him, you're talking with him, you're growing in faith. And so the presence of Jesus, the fact that he's alive, it should impact everything about you and me. And it should empower us to love others more. I want you to pause and think for a minute. I want you, I want you, and sometimes when you hear a sermon, you kind of listen but you're not thinking about your life. You're kind of hearing the message. I want you to be very personal in this message. Because he lives, I love. Let's talk about what that looks like and let's ask God to help us love more as we walk in the presence of the risen Jesus Christ. How can the presence and power of Jesus in you empower you to love others more? Well, first you stop and say, who is a person in my life that I need to love more? It, it could be a spouse, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, 
maybe somebody who lives near you that's also sheltering at home and is kind of dealing with lots of turmoil in, in this crazy world we're living in right now, just stop right now and say, okay, Lord, who is one person who I need to love more? And maybe somebody that sometimes it's tough for me. I won't say it out loud, but in my heart, I know sometimes it's tough to care for them and love them. Who is one person that I need, I need power to love more? And I want you to think for a moment. And I just want to pause with you. And I'm doing the same thing as you're doing. I'm going to think who is one person. And I want you to think about what's one act of love you can share with that person. Maybe it's a word of encouragement. Maybe it's an act of service. Maybe it's just the simple words that you would say to them. You know, it's been a long time since I've looked at you and said, I love you, but I love you so much. And, and through the power of Jesus, the living Jesus Christ, What's an action you can take for that person to show love in the coming days? And I want to pray with you right now. Just let's pause. The sermon's not over yet. We've got a lot more to talk about. But in this sermon, we're going to stop a number of times just to pray and ask Jesus Christ, the living Christ, to work in us and through us. And so, Jesus, this is our prayer. Lord, this person that you put on our heart right now, who needs to be loved in a fresh new way, who needs to be loved more consistently, more strongly, and God, we're the person you want to Bring your love through. We pray, oh God, help us love this person with greater tenderness, with greater consistency. Lord, the person I'm thinking of right now, God, this person needs to be reminded of your love. And I know you're calling me to just to speak words of encouragement, to text some words of encouragement, to let them know that I love them. Jesus, because you live I can love other people more. And we pray, oh God, that when this service is done, that we pick up the phone, that we get on our computer to send a note, that we communicate or that we take action that shows your love. Lord, help us to love this person you placed on our heart in a new and a fresh way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you to follow through on that and don't forget. Because he loves, more happens. Be, because, because he lives, because Jesus Christ is risen and he's alive today, I can forgive as he forgave me. Man, this is a big one. This is challenging. Uh, we, we talked about this at, at night of worship. If you were at night of worship, uh, if you were online following that service, we talked about Jim and Elizabeth Elliot and how Jim Elliot was killed by the very people he went to share the gospel with. And his wife, Elizabeth, rather than becoming bitter at God or bitter at those people, she learned the language of the Aka people, these people in Ecuador who had never heard about Jesus. She spent two years, this widow with a little girl who'd lost her husband, the very people who killed her husband, two years later after she learned their language, she went to share Jesus with them. And the first man in that Aka village who became a Christian had actually killed two of the, the missionaries who went to share Jesus, that had gone with her husband to share Jesus. And Elizabeth Elliot shared the love and the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus. And one of the reasons this man became a Christian is he looked at Elizabeth Elliot and he said, we killed your husband and yet you came and told us about Jesus. She forgave them. She loved them. There is power in forgiveness. Because Jesus lives, I can forgive as he forgave. Listen to these words from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. We're told, to be kind and compassionate to one another. And listen to this. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Forgiving each other just in the same way that God in Christ forgave you, forgave me. That's how we forgive others. That's a lot of forgiveness. That's a lot of of saying, I will let my bitterness and my anger go so I can forgive you in the power and the name of Jesus. A question for you. How can the astounding forgiveness of the one who lives in you move you to greater forgiveness? How can just pondering and remembering all you've been forgiven, how can that lead you to forgive others? I want to encourage you to, to do a little exercise I want to encourage you to, to just go find a quiet place today for five or ten minutes and just, and just think about, Jesus, what have you forgiven in my life? Think through your childhood. 
Think through the, the middle school years, the high school years. Maybe, maybe you're in high school, maybe you're high school age. Think up to this point. The, th- the things you've thought, the things you've said, the things you've done that don't honor God. And just remember that on the cross, Jesus bore those sins and took your shame and took your punishment and he threw it all away. He said, it's gone, it's finished, it's paid for, it's done. And, and just say, oh Jesus, and just let's pray right now. Say, oh Jesus, as you have forgiven me, you call me to forgive others. Lord, keep clear in my mind all that you've forgiven, all that you've washed, uh, washed away and cleansed in me. And Jesus, this is our prayer. As we remember the greatness of your forgiveness, that even right now you will put someone on our heart, someone on our mind, someone who has wronged us, someone who's hurt us. And may we have the courage to extend forgiveness. May may we not become bitter towards you or bitter towards them. But let us extend your grace and your forgiveness. Lord, we know that that doesn't mean that if we forgive someone, we let them hurt us again or treat us badly. But it does mean we let our bitterness and anger go and we give it to you. We bring it to the foot of the cross where you forgave us. So God, give us the power to forgive those who've wronged us and let that forgiveness be so apparent that they are drawn to the heart of you, Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in your name. Amen. Because he lives, everything changes. Our lives are different. And because he lives, I can show grace as I have received it. See, grace and forgiveness are two different things. Forgiveness is is forgetting and letting go of and doing the best we can to not act bitterly towards someone because they've wronged us. But grace is lavishing on others what they don't deserve. Grace, Grace is saying, you may not deserve this encouragement or this gift or this kindness, but I will lavish it on you because God has poured out his grace on me. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. In Ephesians 2, we read these words. Verse 6 says, And God raised up, raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. So it starts with God's grace to us, of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. The greatest gift of grace we have is Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. Verse eight. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Oh, look what I did. I'm so filled with grace. No, you can't brag about this one. Verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Just look at verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. By God's grace. So here's the question for us. Who needs to experience the lavish and amazing grace of Jesus through you? And how can you show it? Who needs to be lavished with kindness and goodness and patience? Who needs needs to experience grace from you? And I would make a suggestion. If you have children or grandchildren, nieces or nephews, young people, they need to experience grace. We live in a a graceless world. We, We live in a kind of a cold and harsh world. And people being lavish. Sometimes we, we, we may lavish toys and gifts, but, but grace is just is God-filled kindness and goodness and tenderness and encouragement and blessing. Speak words of grace. Extend actions of grace. So just pause for a minute and say, who is someone in, in, in my life, in my circle of influence, that needs to experience the grace of Jesus? It could be somebody that already knows Jesus. It could be somebody who's not a Christian yet. And how might you extend grace? You know, forgiveness is saying, I'm not holding against you what you did that was wrong. But grace is saying, you know, you may not have done anything wrong, but I want to do that which is right and show the grace of Jesus to you. I, I think about the people who were gracious to me before I became a Christian. 
I think about Doug Drainville, this, this young college student who would drive me anywhere I wanted to go and never charge me a penny, never ask for gas money. He was a Christian, I wasn't, and he just, he just graced me and graced me and graced me with free rides in his car. I think about how my sister Gretchen would clean my room and do chores for me for no reason, grace. And I certainly didn't deserve it because I did not treat her well. And it was those acts of grace and those acts of kindness, that undeserved outpouring of goodness that, that opened my eyes to begin to see Jesus before I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus in Doug Drainville. I saw Jesus in Gretchen Harney, my big sister. I saw Jesus before I saw Jesus because they showed me grace and I didn't deserve it. So Lord Jesus, we pray that you will put in our, in our minds and our hearts at least one person today who just needs to experience acts of grace and words of grace, to have lavished on them goodness and kindness and tenderness that show your presence. May people see you, Jesus. May they see you in us before they finally see you in who you are. Let the grace that you've shown us overflow as we extend it to others. We pray this for your glory, Jesus, and for the good of the world. Amen. When we understand that he lives, things begin to change. Our lives begin to change. Our behaviors begin to change. Because he lives, I can point to him so that others can see him. Because he lives, I can say to others, look, here's Jesus. He's real, he's risen, he's alive, he's in my life. In John chapter eight, verse 12, we read this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We can point to him who is the light of life. His light shines in us and his light shines through us. Jesus is the light of the world, but you're called to be the light of the world. Our light is reflected light. It's light that reflects off our lives to others. It's, it's, it's light that comes as Jesus lives in us. It's his light, not our light. But we become the light of the world because Christ lives in us. And then in Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16, we read this. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, just like a light on a stand, in the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In the same way that a light that you put on a stand illuminates a room, in the same way that, that when you turn a light on, it illuminates a room, it says your light should shine as the light of Christ is in you, it should shine for others. So here's a question for you. Who needs to see Jesus? And what story can I tell of his presence and power? Who do you know that needs to see Jesus? And can you tell a story of the presence and the power of something God did in you or did through you or something he carried you through? Can you, what story can you tell that will cause people to look and say, wow, this Jesus thing just might be true. Wow, there's a light shining in you I haven't seen before. I remember going to visit my dad when he lived down in Orange County. He's in North Carolina now, but he lived in Orange County, so I would go down whenever I could and visit him. And I remember going down one time and really feeling like I needed to try to shine the light of Jesus in my dad's life. So I'd asked him permission to take him out to lunch and told him, I just want to talk to you about what Jesus has done in my life. My plan was over lunch, just to take the lunchtime and share with him every thing I could remember in my life that Jesus had, did, that had done in, in and through me that was just showing the presence of, of God. And so in that, in that two-hour lunch, I, my dad was very gracious and very patient, and he listened to everything I had to share very kindly. But a couple of times, he got very emotional. And a couple of times, he began to well up with tears. And they were not the expected times. At one point, I was telling my dad, I said, Dad, I want to just share with you how real I believe God is. And so I told him a story of when I was serving a church in West Michigan, a church called Corinth Reformed Church. I served that church for 14 years. And I said, Dad, there was a point where we needed to build a new building. We didn't, we, the church was growing rapidly. 
And we need, to, we need to build children's classrooms and a youth center and a new worship space. And we actually built a two full court basketball gyms, just this whole new addition and an office complex. And I said, you know, Dad, I had to ask the whole congregation to pray about giving towards this. And I knew that before I could ask them to give and before I could ask the church board to give, I had to talk with my wife about what we should give. And so I just told my dad, I said, Dad, I want you to know that what happened was I prayed and prayed and God finally put an amount on my heart that I thought that my wife and I were supposed to give. But it was an amount that was so big that it just just didn't seem responsible. It was all of our savings, all of our extra money and money we didn't have yet. But that was the amount God called me to give. And I had to go talk to my wife about it. So I'm telling my dad this across the table at Mimi's Cafe. And my dad's listening. And I said, so dad, I had this exact, I I said, dad, I heard heard God, not with my ears, in my heart, give me an exact amount. And it was a big amount of money, more than I had. And I said, and dad, I went to Sherry and I said, Sherry, you need to pray because God's gonna call us to give and we have to lead the way and I need to be in this with you. And, And I told my dad, my wife looked at me and she said, oh, I don't have to pray. I already know how much God wants us to give. And I said, what? She says, yeah, I was running the other day. My wife used to run. She loves to run. And she was running. She, I was running. And I was on, on my run, and I was on this one cul-de-sac, and I was praying because I knew that we were going to have to decide because I knew we would have to lead the way as a pastor. Pastor's wife would lead the way. She said, so I was praying, and God gave me an amount. And I said, how much? And she told me the exact same amount of money that God had told me. And I looked at my dad, and I saw tears well up in his eyes. Not tears of how could you give money away, but tears that we, my wife and I, so know Jesus, this living Lord, that, he would, that this God would speak to us and give us the same big challenge. And when I shared that story, I looked at my dad and I said, Dad, I believe in a God who's alive, who speaks, who leads. I don't question that he's alive at all because he leads me like that. And my dad's eyes welled up with tears. Our testimony of how God speaks and leads and guides us in little ways and in big ways has power. Jesus, this is our prayer, that we will shine your light, that that we will know that you are so alive and present in us that your light shines through us. And so Jesus, we pray that we will think about people in our life who don't know you and that we would have the courage to tell our stories of how you have spoken to us because, God, you speak, how you have led us because, God, you lead, how you have comforted us in deep times of pain and loss, and we couldn't have made it through if it wasn't for the living Lord Jesus putting your arms around us, Jesus, and caring for us. Let us tell these stories to people who just don't know if you're real, but we do know. Let us share our stories and shine your light that they will see your power and your glory and be drawn to your heart. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, one more because. Because he lives, and Jesus lives, he's risen, he's with us. Because he lives, I can walk daily, I can walk in daily victory because he has won the battle. Because Jesus lives, because he rose from the dead and broke the power of sin and hell and death, I can walk in daily victory in the small things and the big things because he's alive. Listen to these words from 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 4. In 1 John 5, 4, we read this. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Our faith in this risen, living Jesus helps us walk in power. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Your faith in Jesus gives you overcoming power and victory over challenges, over temptations, over addictions, over fears, over anxiety for the future. Faith in Jesus Christ, that he is living, he is alive, and he's with you, gives you strength to stand in victory. So here's the last question. Where is the battle raging And what is your next step into full victory in the power of Jesus? Where is the battle in your life? Where is the temptation? Where is the addiction? Where is the fear? Where is that spirit? And and you just feel that spiritual battle going. And it could be a new battle or it could be a battle that you fought a hundred times through the years. But you're still raging in that battle. And you're saying, God, I want to know your victory and I want to know your power. I want to finish our time together by praying that we, we would walk and live in the victory of Jesus Christ because he lives. 
Because he's alive, you and I can walk in victory. Everything's changed. So pray with me. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, you left the glory of heaven. You came among us as one of us. You died on the cross in our place and for our sins. Jesus, you were buried for three days. And on the third day, oh Jesus, you rose again in power and in glory. And you walked on this earth and you, and you called people to yourself and you taught and you did miracles and then you ascended to heaven. And you sent the Spirit to be with us and among us and, and now today, Jesus, you live your present in power in our lives. Let us walk in your victory. Let us face our fears and name our anxieties and acknowledge our addictions and recognize the temptations that we face. And Jesus, give us the power of your resurrection and the power of your presence as our living Lord to say yes to you and no to the lies and the deceit of the enemy. Jesus, because you live, we can love and walk in victory and extend grace and forgiveness. Our worlds have changed because you live and you're in us. So let us walk in your power and walk in your victory, and reflect your light and your glory. We pray this, Jesus, in your name, risen, living Jesus Christ, and for your glory. And everyone at home, wherever you are, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I hope and pray that this week you will walk in the presence of the living Lord. And then join us on Friday for, for any of our Good Friday services as, as we think about, about the, the sacrifice of Jesus, the price he paid. And then be sending invitations and calls and texts to friends about Easter Sunday worship. Invite people to come and join you for our Easter celebration. Before I close our service with a word of blessing, I want to give you two invitations. First, if you need prayer, and especially we got that last, that last area of walking in victory. Maybe there's an area you've been having battles and you need the prayers of God's people with you. If you need prayer, call the number you see on the screen and we'll connect you with one of our leaders who would love to, with, with, in confidentiality, would love to pray for you and pray with you. If you've got a joy you want to share, call and pray about that as well. But be sure to take time to pray with us. Yeah, also, if you're, if you're following and if you're in the chat discussion, you can share prayers in the chat also and we'll pray for you that way as well. And here's the second thing. We know a lot of people at Shoreline have been inviting friends to church online. If this is your first time with us online, you're, you're, you're part of Shoreline today because you're online, but you're part of his church today. We're so glad you're here. And we invite you to come back and, and be part of our services as we go forward in the coming weeks, as long as we're online. And if you live in the area when we start meeting here in the worship center again, we invite you to come and join us here. But for now, would you just, in the chat feature there, would you, would you give a note and say you're new and tell us about yourself and someone will interact with you? Or call the number and say, this is my first time with Shoreline. And we want to just follow up and get to know you and give you a special welcome. And so contact us if you want prayer and contact us if you're new. And for all of you, I'm going to ask you, you don't have to, but if you want to, I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. We close our services where we're standing together and I give a word of blessing. So if you'd stand if you could where you are. And you might even want to take your hands and turn them upwards like someone's going to pour out a bunch of fresh fruit or, or M&Ms, whatever you want to fill your hands with. Just put your hands like you're going to receive and receive these words of blessing. As we close this time, as you go into the rest of your day, may you know the presence of the living Lord Jesus Christ. May you see his face and feel his presence and walk in his power. And as you do that, may you extend grace and forgiveness and shine the light of Jesus even when you're sheltered at home, even when you're going out doing essential work, May you shine the light of Jesus with every person you interact with for his glory. God bless you. Have a great day. And we'll see you Friday for Good Friday services. And we'll see you Easter Sunday for one of our services throughout the day. God bless you. Have a great day.